Do you hear? Oh, okay. All right, we are back now with the uh, from the newsroom with the Salem News reporters, and you can see that uh, we have one of our reporters once again on the road. Uh, Dustin Luca moving downtown Salem. Uh, Paul Layton in his studio, and me in mine. And a guy that Dustin, I got to start with you. I do feel like I'm sitting here at the anchor desk uh, with you out in the street. So <laughs> welcome. Hi, how you doing? Very well, very well. Um, and fortunately, you're out there and it's stopped. Okay? It's stopped. It's stopped uh, and I storming. just walked past a UPS truck that started, so I did not hear what you just asked. Well, tell me where you are. Uh, so I'm downtown right now, uh, heading to, I'm just, there's a couple things going on in town today. I was going to be checking out right after we get off the horn here. Um, but one of the things I'm actually heading to right now is a uh, site that was basically kind of hosting a, a homeless camp for the last several, really couple of months. It started in November, and this has been kind of a story that really kind of took over the city because a lot of people were, looking at this and basically saying, how could you allow this kind of display in our city? A lot of people were targeting the mayor. And then you had a lot of other people that kind of came out and basically said, well, listen, people who are homeless, people who are unhoused are actually human beings. They actually have rights. And it turned into this really, really heavy discussion about what, you know, is allowed on public property, what's not allowed. So what this thing, and I apologize if it sounds like I'm out of breath, just having to run from UPS. But um, <laughs> basically what ended up happening is the city was really kind of had its hands tied in what was going on because there's very few things that they can actually go after a homeless camp for. Um, when you're on public property, if you're not tied to a building, if you don't have any stakes in the ground, if it's basically a temporary structure that's not violating any fire codes, health codes or anything like that, then there's really nothing they can do. And one of the things that ended up coming up, which was really interesting, is there was objections with this camp because they were tying tents to a public building, Old Town Hall, which is this lovely building right here. And one of so they basically went out there with a cease and desist order, basically saying can't be tied to a public building. It's a fire code violation. If there's, you know, a fire hazard or something like that, you're blocking an egress. And what ended up happening is they were able to get them to basically stop tying it to the building. And that's where the enforcement stopped. And I at one point had to ask them, you know, it, as a regular person, whether I'm housed or not, is there anything preventing, preventing me from going to Salem Common and pitching a tent? And they actually couldn't answer the question immediately. And then later on said, Effectively, there's nothing that says you cannot pitch a tent on like private property, sale common, anything like that. But what ultimately happened with this, because you can, I'm here now, this is where the camp was. It was actually between a couple of the staircases. And mm -hmm. what ended up happening is they were able to find beds for these folks. Uh, a couple of, I think, like Fridge helped connect them to a couple of other cities and things like that. The city was able to ultimately eliminate the camp because they're able to find other beds in other locations. But basically, unless there are beds available, there's nothing they can do to touch the camp. And that's kind of one of the really big lessons that came out of the story. Thank you for that and, and, and showing us all the, uh, the pictures as well. I love your cameraman because he's walking backwards while you're... <laughs> Going forward, no. um, you know it's it's weird, it's awful, and I'm, I wanted to talk to Senator Tarr about this because um, I was recently in Boston by mass and gas. And I, I've yeah. never seen I've never seen anything like that, and it's gut and, and mass and gas actually became a really really big thing, and unfortunately the. So Mass and Cass was an it was an encampment in Boston that was set up, and I can't remember exactly the name of the streets, but one of them is Massachusetts Avenue. That's where the name came from, and it was ultimately the same exact situation. They couldn't find beds in the area, so they couldn't touch it. And then ultimately, you know, it's so there were all these different, and it was exactly the same conversation. This display, what is it doing to us? Well, you can't say that because these are human beings; they have rights. And so it's these have been really transformative conversations. I think have actually gotten into a lot of people's heads and actually kind of shifted the conversation a little bit I, in a positive direction, in terms of you know, first off, making sure that we're using people per people for first, you know, language to talk about people who are unhoused as opposed to homeless people or something like that. Just people kind of becoming more intelligent and more educated in terms of how to talk about this, how to actually help people who need services and actually connecting them with those services. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Well, we bring on Paul Layton and uh, old friend Paul Layton. How are you? Good, Rick. Good. I feel like I should uh, be walking around my house while I'm uh, talking. <laughs> Isn't that a cool though when he's pointing out the side? I love that. I know. Uh -huh. It's fantastic. Oh That's my great. goodness. Next Next, we'll have them up in a helicopter, I suppose. I don't yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let's get serious now, Paul. A story that uh, actually, if you're investigative reporting that has brought this thing, I think, uh, full, I hate to use the word full circle, but to fruition. And that concerns the Varian cleanup. Give me a, a brief thumbnail of, uh, of, your, of your writing over the years and where we are right now. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Uh, well, Varian is this industrial site in Beverly on Sawyer Road, sort of over the hill from the high school near where the Whole Foods Plaza is across the street. 
in, um, in the 1990s, contamination was discovered on the property. It was pretty common back in the day that they were dumping all these solvents into the uh, ground back in the 50s and 60s. So um, Varian, the company that used to own the property, is on the hook to clean it up and uh, to get rid of the contamination that's underground. They're under a state program that requires uh, them to clean up the property, get rid of the con contamination. The worry is that this contamination is flowing in the groundwater underground, getting into the neighborhoods and the businesses along Tozier Road and the contaminants can vaporize and get into these buildings. So that's what the concern is. And so this was a big issue 30 years ago and it was on the front pages and then it sort of faded from view. And I did a story, it's more than two years ago now. And I looked at the test results and talked to some experts, but the bottom line is it, it was still a big problem. And since that story, there's been a lot more attention paid to it. There's been public meetings, local politicians involved, the state got more involved. So the latest is there was a public meeting uh, the other night at Beverly High School where Varian, uh, Varian was ordered by the state Department of Environmental Protection to come up with a new plan. The one they've been doing for 30 years is not working. There's still lots of contamination on the property. And so Varian laid out their new plan last night. A lot of it's technical, but some of the interesting uh, things are they're going to... Uh, in the location on the property where the contamination is the worst underground, they're going to use what's called thermal radiation. So they superheat the ground to more to more than 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, from what I understand, it vaporizes the chemicals and then they can collect them and treat them and get them off site. There's these other plans on a stream. They're going to put these barriers, uh, these barriers, these barriers that they compare to like a Brita filter to prevent the chemicals from seeping into the stream under Tozier Road, under the road and several locations are going to put this different type of barrier, uh, I keep saying barriers, barriers that they drop in underground. And one of the scientists that's working for Varian referred to them as like catcher's mitts. They catch the contamination and treat the contamination. So there's all these new techniques that they're going to finally start to employ, it's going to cost them millions of dollars. And they said that they hope to finally have it all cleaned up to the standards that they need to within two and a half years. Great reporting. And I wonder when, when people use jargon, um, if they're really telling, telling us the story, I hope they can simplify it a little bit more, you know, because um, as I'm listening to this, you know, I'm thinking, huh, what? <laughs> so, uh, Right. Well, that's why I thought it was I thought it was good that actually a couple of the residents said use the term. Is it like a Brita filter? And they said, yeah. yeah. And then one of the, the scientists said it's like a catcher's mitt. So it does. that. That's been one of the problems in writing about this story. It's ultimately a very technical story. Yeah. And so they're going to use this technique. Is that good or not? Well, how do we know? You know, you have to rely on the experts and it can be difficult to write about. But uh, the bottom line is that they employing these new techniques and uh, expensive techniques. And um, so hopefully this will work. I want to get back to you about uh, covering stories, but I want to go to Dustin too, because um, there's a story uh, now about um, a hotel on Bridge Street um, that I used to, I think it's called the Clipper Hotel. I used to go by it every day on my way to Marblehead to the, to the radio station. Um, and I, I never stayed there, but, but I'm wondering why it's back in the news or why it's even in the news. And Dustin, if you would uh, bring me up to speed. Yeah, so um, this is a developing story. Uh, basically, Clippership Inn is a uh, hotel that I think it has 54 rooms along Bridge Street, so at, at 40 Bridge Street, kind of the northern end by Beverly. Um, it's it, it's basically one of several kind of landmark hotels. Everybody, when you hear the name, you know exactly where it is. You know what it looks like. You know what the sign looks like because the thing's been there forever. And in fact, I think its business name was like the Pilgrim Hotel or something like that. It's just it has you know like a kind of a status in the city. Um, it's kind of on and off had trouble with pay, keeping up with taxes and things like that and there was actually a big story in 2019 that we basically ended up scrapping at the last second because the hotel was almost on the auction block and then at the last second they're able to avoid the auction because it you know came down to foreclosure and things like that they're able to basically keep everything online 
a couple of weeks ago, fences popped up and, you know, Merrimack Savings Bank signs popped up on it and, you know, people started parking in front of it and everybody's kind of like, oh, hey, what's going on over at the Clipper ship? So what has happened is that it's actually been bought by a uh, group of people that are associated with Herrick Lutz in Beverly. Um, Peter Lutz is one of the three people involved, uh, emailed me in the last couple of weeks to confirm that they have indeed bought it and that their intention is to keep it a hotel, but they're kind of holding off for the time being on talking any further in terms of what they might call it, if there will be a name change, what it'll look like, layout changes, building changes, all of that. They're still kind of working on that and kind of seeing what they're going to do with their baby. So it's a lot is not known at the time being for the time being, but whenever something like this happens, whenever, you know, fences go up around a property like that, it kind of sparks a little bit of hysteria around Salem, which Salem knows this thing about hysterias. Um, (laughs) And people start saying, Oh my God, it's going to turn into condos. or Oh my God, it's going to turn to luxury apartments. And you know, that's, those are words that keep kind of circulating. So it was really great to actually hear from Peter Lutz and basically say, no, it's going to stay a hotel and we'll figure out all the other details later on but it's not becoming apartments. It's going to stay a hotel. So that's all we know for the time being. We'll know more in a couple of weeks. That's when the, the team's going to kind of come forward and kind of share a little bit of insight in terms of the kind of the direction they're heading in. There are several stories that you both do frequently um, uh, uh, that are delicate in terms of uh, getting information, getting interviews and so on. And Dustin, I want to start with you in terms of your training, your schooling and so on. There are certain elements of journalism you know, that, that everybody knows about. And of course, now with the transition to all uh, electronic for the most part, um, it, it's added more to what you have to do with fewer staff. Um, how does that work in terms of the stories you want to cover? And maybe like you just said, going back and, and doing um, research on, on a story that seems kind of not so important, but then you find out it, it kind of is. Um, so in, in learning on the job, I guess, is what I'm asking you. There's With so few staff now that you have, how do you get these assignments and, and how do you uh, change from from talking to someone, knowing what. I'm, just ha- tell me a little bit about your job. I guess is what I'm asking because it's fascinating. <laughs> so it's it, it's it's challenging, but it's also really fun. I think because we tend to what we are ultimately tasked with doing, other than being a you know a mirror to society, basically show society what it looks like. We also have to learn about things and then be teachers, basically, and. Ex- explain that to other people. And I think that's a really rewarding aspect of the job. It is challenging. And as kind of staff sizes have dwindled and things like that, and that's happened with every newspaper in the area for the newspapers that are actually still standing because the number have fallen, you know, since the pandemic started, you know, it, it, it is more challenging. It's we're having to, you know, kind of, shift our model in terms of how we keep the lights on and things like that. We're taking on more publications that we're printing and that's kind of moved deadlines up a little bit and that makes it tougher to cover meetings at night, for example. That's a challenge that I think a lot of people might lose sight of. I had just talked about how, you know, there was an investigative story I did on Clippership Inn that, you know, I worked on for weeks and then ultimately never panned out. So there's a number of times where we'll be working on stories that either don't come to fruition or they don't come to fruition in the way that we expect. And sometimes the, the fun in the job is the way that those things come together and kind of surprise you. And I know Paul has has had that kind of thing evolve with him with with Varian over and over again, where it's just the surprises and surprises and surprises that continually change the story and the nature of what he's reporting on. So I don't know if, Paul, you want to jump in there. Yeah, no, definitely, Dustin. Uh, Yeah, Rick, I I know I've talked to you about this, I think, offline a few times, but how the state of journalism uh, these days and, uh, you know, a lot of newspapers have gone out of business and uh, so there's actually been more focus on local journalism and, and its role in a community. And uh, so I think it's, a, I think it's um, like it's an important job in that respect to keep an eye on local government, uh, to investigate things that otherwise wouldn't come to uh, light. So like Dustin said, I think that's really the really rewarding part of the job and an important part of the uh, job is to focus on things where, it, you know, there's a lot of information online and on Facebook and social media, and it's hard to keep up with all that. But but I believe it's only newspapers and news organizations that can do the investigative type of work and get to the bottom of things that otherwise the public wouldn't know about. And, you know, Varian is one of the examples of uh, that and I really like it when even though we're a small news organization now a lot smaller than we used to be uh, like if we do the the stories the right way and do the legwork and the reporting they can have an impact and again not just to tout me or they just to sort of show the importance of local journalism this variant story this wouldn't this company this three billion dollar company in California wouldn't be spending millions of dollars 
uh, taking uh, these extra steps to clean up this contamination that's been worrying these neighbors for years if you know, we didn't write and print that story. So that shows the impact that that uh, local journalism can have. Yeah, and, and congratulations for that. I'm sure the neighborhood is uh, is uh, satisfied with that kind of reporting. And, and, you know, the Salem News reputation has been so strong over the years. And I think, I guess the final question I would ask you guys is, um, y y when you do a story, um, uh, when, when you go to talk to someone, you have to have done your homework. And I'm guessing that when you talk face to face to someone about a delicate story, whatever it might be, um, you live in the neighborhood, you live in the very place that you're reporting and walking around and you see your name on the paper. Um, it, it has to be a delicate balance in your own mind sometimes, but as experienced reporters, it also has to be a little bit easier than it was when you first started. And Dustin, if you, if you understand what I'm trying to ask, would you respond? Well, I kind of I feel like at this point, I've been doing it for so long. I, I, I'm, I'm not like a veteran of the industry. I've only been doing this since 2010, but I kind of feel like I, I kind of run on autopilot a lot of the time. Like this week, you know, I think it was on Tuesday, I was working on a couple of stories. And then at 2.45, we got, you know, our eyes on a Beverly Police Department press release on the Pickled Onion having, you know, four arrests associated with the shooting from December. And it just, you know, things like that kind of turn everything on its head. And, you know, it's we have to be really, really kind of flexible and adapt, be ready to drop a story within like a, a moment's notice, tear up page one when there's a fire at seven o'clock at night. You know, it's there's a lot of balls that get thrown around. Some get caught, some, some get put down very quickly. And I don't know if I'm answering the question or if I'm just babbling, yes, yes, but absolutely. it's a very dynamic job. And I remember um, there was a friend of mine that went to the uh, kind of the dark side, as we call it, to PR. And they had mentioned how much easier it was because they're not constantly on a deadline. Well, you know, and, and Paul, uh, picking up where Dustin had uh, left off for me, um, it, it, I, I know what it feels like to, to work and get so much things ready to go, and all of a sudden, poof, you can't even use it. <laughs> and then you have to turn your attention very quickly to something else. And so, uh, you know, with your experience in dealing with people, I'm, I'm sure that um, you, I'm sure you have a lot of anecdotes you could mention uh, privately, <laughs> but you can't, you got to be careful with what you actually goes to print. Right. No, that's true. And, uh, I think what you said, it can be difficult when you live in the community and you know people and yet you have to write, you know, controversial stories. You have to ask them tough questions. You write stories that they don't like and they don't want you to uh, write. And it's true when, you know, when I first started out, that was really difficult. I started out in sports, as you know, Rick, that's how we know each other. And in high school sports, you don't, it's not really confrontational often unless something really bad happens. And uh, when you switch to the news side, I think you have to be a little tougher. Actually, to be honest with you, I had to be a little tougher with that. And the way I approach it is I just, uh, you know, I need to ask these questions. So I do. But you just you have to be honest and upfront and people shouldn't be surprised by what's in the newspaper the next day. I think as long as you're honest, that's the answer. And I think I've even mentioned this before, like I can be on uh, you know, the treadmill at the Y, uh, you know, next to the mayor, you know, the same uh, night that I wrote a story that he doesn't like. Right. And in fact, I was at the Y last night and Mayor K. was at the Y, you know, and, um, but in he and most people are good about that. They understand my job. If, if I write something that they don't like, as long as I'm honest and upfront and, and fair about it, then that's the role of the local journalist. So it's, it's a little tricky because I'm not like pals with everybody. But there's a respect uh, too. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not yes, gonna. Yeah, that's exactly like, the word I was gonna like, use. I can't, you know, I can't do you any favors because I've known you for 30 years. I, I just, I can't do that. I'd be out of a job, you know. And you know, people generally understand it. And if they don't, I just think, well, that's their problem, and um, I just have to do my job. Yeah, and as long yeah, respect is, is the word. You guys, uh, you know, have been part of a great tradition in Salem News, and uh, you know, when when you when you tell them. Um, you're working on a story. Well, bingo, they got to know how to respond if they want to or not. So yeah, that great. That's on them. Dustin, as we end this thing, um, can you tease anything that you might be working on coming up? Anything in the pipeline or you just want to leave it as it is? Uh, well, tonight we got a really busy city council meeting. Um, there's been this kind of really fiery accessory dwelling unit ordinance, uh, in-law apartment kind of thing that's been going for several years in Salem. 
Um, there's an update on that that's been kind of working through the city council and a cleared committee, one part of it on a five to four vote, very, very narrow. One person was absent, so their vote will be deciding it tonight. And that's kind of what everybody's watching for. And uh, half an hour from now, there's going to be a protest in front of uh, Representative Seth Moulton's office in regards to diplomacy for Ukraine. Um, so that'll be in the paper tomorrow as well. Otherwise, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Paul, what do you got going on? <laughs> Uh, that's a good question, Dustin. As you know, it's like day to day. Well, the Beverly City Council actually uh, met last night and I'm going to watch a recording of the meeting. There's this big issue in Beverly about whether the city should limit uh, the heights of buildings in the downtown. You know, new buildings, not current buildings. They're not going to take off the top stories of any current buildings, but in terms of a zoning, uh, <laughs> zoning proposal. So that's a big one. And uh, yeah, and I, I've been writing about uh, the situation at Beverly Airport with the former, uh, you know, airport manager too. So that's ongoing as well. 